chapter one of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter one conspiracies in the north opposition to the government by constitutional means was not enough to gratify the vehement and resentful feelings of those democrats in the north whose zeal for slavery seemed completely to have destroyed in their hearts every impulse of patriotism they were ready to do the work of the southern confederacy in the north and were alone prevented by their fear of the law to evade the restraints of justice and the sharp measures of the military administration they formed throughout the country secret associations for the purpose of resisting the laws of embarrassing in every way the action of the government of communicating information to the rebels in arms and in many cases of inflicting serious damage on the lives and property of the unionists they adopted various names in different parts of the country but the designation chosen by the society having the largest number of lodges in the several states was the knights of the golden circle as fast as one name was discovered and published it was cast aside and another adopted and the same organization with the same membership appeared successively under the name we have mentioned and those of the order of american knights the order of the star and the sons of liberty these secret organizations possessed a singular charm to uneducated men independent of their political sympathies and this attraction combined with the fact that they could not in plain daylight inflict any injury upon the government drove many thousands of the lower class of democrats into these furtive lodges it is impossible to ascertain with any degree of exactness the numbers of those who became affiliated with the orders the numbers claimed by the adepts vary widely a million was not infrequently the membership of which they boasted mr vallandigham asserted in a public speech that the organized body numbered half a million judge holt in his official report accepted this aggregate as being something near the truth the heaviest force was in illinois and in indiana in ohio they were also very numerous and in the border states of kentucky and missouri their organization was entirely military the state lodges were commanded by major generals the congressional districts by brigadiers the counties by colonels and the townships by captains they drilled as much as was possible under the limitations of secrecy they made large purchases of arms general h b carrington estimated that thirty thousand guns and revolvers were brought into indiana alone and the adherents of the order in the state of illinois were also fully armed in the month of march eighteen sixty four it was estimated that the entire armed force of the order capable of being mobilized for active service was three hundred and forty thousand men it is altogether probable that this estimate was greatly exaggerated and even if so large a number had been initiated into the order their lack of drill discipline and moral character rendered them incapable of at any time of acting as an army the order was large enough at least to offer the fullest hospitality to detectives and to union men who volunteered to join with the purpose of reporting what they could to the authorities so that the government was speedily put in possession of the entire scheme of organization with the names of the prominent officers of the order and written copies of their constitutions oaths and books of ritual the constitutions of secret societies are generally valuable only as illustrations of human stupidity and these were no exception to the rule 
their declaration of principles begins with the lucid proposition all men are endowed by the creator with certain rights equal as far as there is equality in the capacity for the appreciation enjoyment and exercise of those rights the institution of slavery receives the approval of this band of midnight traders in the following muddled and brutal sentences in the divine economy no individual of the human race must be permitted to encumber the earth to mar its aspects of transcendent beauty nor to impede the progress of the physical or intellectual man neither in himself nor in the race to which he belongs hence a people whom neither the divinity within them nor the inspirations of divine and beautiful nature around them can impel to virtuous action and progress onward and upward should be subjected to a just and humane servitude and tutelage to the superior race until they shall be able to appreciate the benefits and advantages of civilization they also declare in favour of something they imagine to be the theory of state rights and also the duty of the people to expel their rulers from the government by force of arms when they see good reason this is not revolution they say but solely the assertion of right had they been content to meet in their lodges at stated times and bewilder themselves by such rhetoric as this there would have been no harm done but there is plenty of evidence that the measures they adopted to bring what they call their principles into action were of positive injury to the national welfare one of their chief objects was the exciting of discontent in the army and the encouraging of desertion members of the order enlisted with the express purpose of inciting soldiers to desert with them money and citizens clothing were furnished them for this purpose lawyers were hired to advise soldiers on leave not to go back and to promise them the requisite defence in the courts if they got into trouble by desertion the adjutant-general of indiana in his report for eighteen sixty three says that the number of deserters and absentees returned to the army through the post of indianapolis alone during the last month of eighteen sixty two was about two thousand six hundred the squads of soldiers sent to arrest deserters were frequently attacked in rural districts by these organized bodies the most violent resistance was made to the enrollment and the draft several enrolling officers were shot in indiana and in illinois about sixty persons were tried and convicted in indiana for conspiracy to resist the draft a constant system of communication with the rebels in arms was kept up across the border arms ammunition and in some instances recruits were sent to aid the confederates secret murders and assassinations were not unknown the plan of establishing a northwestern confederacy in hostility to the east and in alliance with the southern confederacy was the favorite dream of the malignant and narrow minds controlling the order the government wisely took little notice of the proceedings of these organizations it was constantly informed of their general plans and purposes the grand secretary of the order in missouri made a full confession of his connection with it in august a large number of copies of the ritual of the order of american knights was seized in an office which had been occupied by a prominent democratic politician at terre haute a private soldier in the union army named stidger had himself initiated into the order and with infinite skill and success rose to a high position in it becoming grand secretary for the state of kentucky thus thoroughly informed of the composition and purposes of the society the government was constantly able to guard against any serious disturbances of the public peace and whenever the arrest of any of the ringleaders was determined upon the evidence for their conviction was always overwhelming 
the fullest light was thrown upon the organization and plans of these treasonable orders by the trials of certain conspirators in indiana in the autumn of eighteen sixty four we will make no reference to the testimony of government detectives who joined the conspiracy with the purpose of revealing its secrets it is sufficient to quote the unwilling and unquestionably truthful statements of members of the order brought into court by subpoena william clayton a farmer of warren county illinois testified that he was initiated a member of the order of american knights at a congregation formed in the timber he took along an bombastic oath the only significant part of which was the pledge to take up arms if required in the cause of the oppressed against usurpers waging war against a people endeavouring to establish a government for themselves in accordance with the eternal principles of truth this he testified bound him to assist the south in its struggle for independence he said he understood the purpose of the order was primarily to beat the republicans at the polls and that force of arms was to be resorted to in case of necessity that they contemplated a rebel invasion in support of these objects that the understanding was that in case the rebels came into illinois they and the brethren of this organization were to shake hands and be friends that they were to give aid and assistance to the invaders that death was the penalty for divulging the secrets of the order other members testified that they took an oath providing that in case of treachery they were to be drawn and quartered their mangled remains to be cast out at the four gates when these dwellers in prairie villages were asked what they meant by the four gates they said they did not know clayton further said their objects were to resist the conscription or anything else that pushed them too hard another farmer said he joined because he had been a democrat all his life another that he went in out of curiosity and this was doubtless a motive with many in communities where there is little to interest an idle mind these secret mummeries possess a singular attraction the grips the passwords the emblems formed a great part of whatever temptation the order offered to the rural conspirators their favourite cognizance was the oak not on account of any civic association but because the word was formed of the initials of the name order of american knights their grand hailing cry of distress was oak hound the last syllable taken from the name of the south carolina statesmen whose principles they imagined they were putting in operation by far the most important witness for the government was horace heffron a lawyer of salem indiana a man high in the councils of the order he was indicted for treasonable practices and concluded to make a clean breast of it he gave an apparently truthful account detailed the scheme for forming a northwestern confederacy or if that failed for joining the southern army the state government of indiana was to be seized governor morton was to be held for a hostage or killed he confirmed the story of the general uprising which was to have taken place on the sixteenth of august in conjunction with a rebel raid from cumberland gap the great feature of which was the liberation of the confederate prisoners in illinois ohio and indiana but when the time came the rebels did not and the conspirators lacked heart for the fight vallandigham the supreme head of the order was too far away for intelligent and efficient direction the whole conspiracy was shabby and puerile although it included many editors and politicians of local standing they were not all cravens some of them stood up stoutly before the military commission and defended the cause of the south i assert said one that the south has been fighting for their rights as defined in the dred scott decision but there was very little display of heroism when the time of trial arrived there was much that was ignoble and sordid 
a scramble for the salary places a rush to handle the money provided for arms one man intriguing for a place on the staff because he had a sore leg a cloud of small politicians who hardly knew whether they were members or not they had heard a ritual read but paid little attention to it they were anxious to be members if the scheme succeeded and to avoid the law if it failed the president's attitude in regard to this organization was one of good-humored contempt rather than anything else most of the officers commanding departments however regarded the machinations of these dark lantern knights as a matter of the deepest import governor morton was greatly disquieted by their work in his state and sent a telegram to the president in january eighteen sixty three expressing his fear that the legislature when it met would pass a joint resolution to acknowledge the southern confederacy and urge the northwest to dissolve all constitutional relation with the new england states but when the legislature came together although it evinced a hearty good will in giving the governor all the worry and annoyance possible it took no such overt step of treason as he feared their action was indeed sufficiently violent and contumacious the house of representatives insolently returned his message to him and passed a resolution accepting in its stead that of the democratic governor of new york measures were introduced to take the military power of the state away from the governor and to confer it upon the democratic state officers to defeat these unconstitutional proceedings the republicans adopted the equally irregular course of abandoning the legislature and leaving it without a quorum in consequence of which no appropriation bills were passed and the governor had to appeal to the people of the state for the means to carry on the government these were furnished in part by the voluntary offerings of banks private corporations and individuals but needing a quarter of a million dollars for an emergency he came to washington and obtained it from the general government by virtue of a statute of july thirty one eighteen sixty one which set aside two millions for the purchase of munitions of war to be used in states in rebellion or in which rebellion is or may be threatened in view of the revolutionary attitude of the legislature and the known treasonable organization and purposes of the sons of liberty the secretary of war decided that indiana was so threatened and made governor morton a dispersing officer to the amount of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars it is related that morton remarked as he took the warrant if the cause failed they would be called heavily to account for this to which stanton replied if the cause fails i do not wish to live in the summer of eighteen sixty four general rosecrans made a full discovery of the purposes and organization of these conspirators and communicated it to governor yates of illinois who fully shared his solicitude they joined in an earnest demand that the president should order colonel j p sanderson of rosecrans's staff to washington for a personal interview upon matters of overwhelming importance stanton objected to this and the president was unwilling that either rosecrans or his subordinate should come to washington upon such an errand under the temptation to magnify his office by alarming reports he therefore concluded to send one of his own private secretaries to st louis to see precisely what were the facts which had thrown the general commanding into such a state of concern rosecrans then repeated the entire story of the organization of the order of american knights and the golden circle facts which were already well known to the president and the secretary of war but the immediate cause of his excitement was the expected return of vallandigham which he said was in accordance with the resolution adopted by the order at the convocation held in windsor canada general rosecrans thought that his return would be the signal for the rising of the knights throughout the northwest and for serious public disorders 
the president on receiving his secretary's report declined to order sanderson to washington and in reference to rosecrans's strict injunctions of secrecy he said that a secret confided on the one side to half a million democrats and on the other to five governors and their staffs was hardly worth keeping he said the northern section of the conspiracy merited no special attention being about an equal mixture of puerility and malice general rosecrans after he was convinced that the president would not overrule the secretary of war by ordering colonel sanderson to washington concluded at last to send his voluminous report in manuscript accompanying it with the following letter which we copy as giving in few words the results of his researches since major hay's departure bearing my letter about the secret conspiracy we have been tracing out we have added much information of its southern connections operations uses and intentions we have also found a new element in its workings under the name of mcclellan minute men the evident extent and anti-national purposes of this great conspiracy compel me to urge the consideration of what ought to be done to anticipate its workings and prevent the mischief it is capable of producing again upon your attention therefore i have sent the report of colonel sanderson with the details of evidence covering a thousand pages of fool's cap by himself to be carried or forwarded to you by safe hands that report and its accompanying papers show one that there exists an oath-bound secret society under various names but forming one brotherhood both in the rebel and loyal states the objects of which are the overthrow of the existing national government and the dismemberment of this nation two that the secret oaths bind these conspirators to revolution and all its consequences of murder arson pillage and an untold train of crimes including assassination and perjury under the penalty of death to the disobedient or recusant three that they intend to operate in conjunction with rebel movements this summer to revolutionize the loyal states if they can four that vallandigham is the supreme commander of the northern wing of the society and general price of the rebel army the supreme commander of the southern wing of the organization and that vallandigham's return was a part of the program well understood both north and south by which the revolution they proposed was to be inaugurated five that this association is now and has been the principal agency by which spying and supplying rebels with means of war are carried on between the loyal and rebel states and that even some of our officers are engaged in it six that they claim to have twenty thousand members in missouri one hundred and forty thousand in illinois one hundred thousand in indiana eighty thousand in ohio seventy thousand in kentucky and that they are extending through new york new jersey pennsylvania delaware and maryland besides which prominent and general facts the names of members mode of operating and other details appear fully showing what a formidable power and what agencies for mischief we have to deal with with this synopsis of the report it is respectfully submitted with the single remark that whatever orders you may deem best to give it must be obvious to your excellency that leading conspirators like charles l hunt and dr shore of st louis arrested for being implicated in the association cannot be released without serious hazard to the public welfare and safety from first to last these organizations were singularly lacking in energy and initiative the only substantial harm they did was in encouraging desertions and embarrassing and resisting the officers concerned in the enrollment and the draft the toleration with which the president regarded them and the immunity which he allowed them in their passive treason arose from the fact that he never could be made to believe that there was as much crime as folly in their acts and purposes senator macdonald reports that the president once said to him 
when he was asking the pardon of some of these conspirators condemned by military commission nothing can make me believe that one hundred thousand indiana democrats are disloyal they were sufficiently disloyal to take all manner of oaths against the government to declare in their secret councils they were ready to shed the last drop of their blood to abolish it to express their ardent sympathy with its enemies and their detestation of its officers and supporters but this was the limit of their criminal courage shedding the last drop of one's blood is a comparatively easy sacrifice it is shedding the first drop that costs and these rural catalines were never quite ready to risk their skins for their so-called principles most of the attempts against the public peace in the free states and on the northern border proceeded not from the resident conspirators but from desperate southern emissaries and their aiders and abettors in the british provinces and even these rarely rose above the level of ordinary arson and highway robbery the case of the chesapeake was one of the most noteworthy of these incidents two canadians named j c brain and h a parr resolved in the latter part of eighteen sixty three to start on a privateering enterprise on their own account parr though born in canada had lived for several years in tennessee and brain who had been arrested and confined in fort warren had been released from that prison on his claim represented by the british minister that he was a british subject their sole pretension to confederate nationality was the possession of commissions in the confederate navy prepared ad hoc they enlisted a dozen men all british subjects purchased in new york the arms and equipment they required for their enterprise and took passage on board the united states merchant steamer chesapeake which left new york on the fifth of december bound for portland maine on the morning of the eighth they assaulted the officers and crew of the chesapeake capturing her after a struggle of only a few minutes duration killing one and wounding two of her officers they took the chesapeake into the bay of fundy and there delivered her into the hands of a man calling himself captain parker of the confederate navy who afterwards turned out to be an englishman whose name was vernon locke and who had come out in a pilot boat to meet her feeling now secure in the possession of her new nationality she went to sambro harbour nova scotia to receive the fuel and supplies necessary to enable her to prosecute her voyage to the confederate states while she lay there the united states gunboat ella and annie entered the harbour and says mr benjamin whose righteous indignation was evidently aroused by the proceedings with that habitual contempt of the territorial sovereignty of great britain and of her neutral rights which characterizes our enemies recaptured the prize and left the british port with the purpose of taking the chesapeake to the united states but meeting on the way a superior officer of the united states navy the captain of the ella and annie was ordered by him to return to halifax to restore the chesapeake to the jurisdiction of great britain this was done and the few pirates who had been captured in the chesapeake were delivered up the case was taken at once into the courts and was promptly and properly decided so far as the vessel was concerned by her delivery to her rightful owners but before this decision was made known at richmond the confederate government seeing in the case a possibility of profit to their cause dispatched to halifax professor j p holcomb said to be the most accomplished international lawyer in the confederacy to take charge of the case during the professor's transit however by way of wilmington and bermuda the case had come to its natural close and on arriving at halifax he found his occupation gone he was compelled to report to the department that every man concerned in the capture of the chesapeake with the single exception of the canadian tennessean just mentioned was a british subject he also found that the captors had been guilty of stealing and peddling the 
cargo and pocketing the proceeds and that the antecedents of the so-called confederate officers involved were most disreputable he seemed greatly disappointed to find that this gang of murderers and thieves were not high-minded and honourable gentlemen and therefore concluded to make no demand upon the british authorities for the restitution of the stolen ship he remained for some time in halifax enjoying the hospitality of the colonial sympathizers with the south and then proceeded to join the other secession emissaries in canada who were engaged in equally congenial enterprises the principal agent of the confederates in canada was jacob thompson secretary of the interior in the late administration of buchanan whose treasonable conduct of that important office has already been mentioned he had sunk into appropriate insignificance even among his own associates after the war began had been captured by general grant on the mississippi river in a ridiculous attempt at playing the spy under a flag of truce and after being released with contemptuous forbearance had gone to canada under instructions from the rebel government to do what damage he could in connection with the refugees and escaped prisoners who fringed the northern frontier during the last two years of the war he immediately placed himself in communication with the disloyal democrats of the northern states and through them and a band of refugees who at once gathered about him in canada for employment began a series of operations which for their folly no less than their malignity would be incredible if they were not recorded in the report which thompson himself with amazing moral obtuseness wrote of his mission on the third of december eighteen sixty four he states that immediately on his arrival in canada he put himself in communication with the leading spirits of the sons of liberty he was received among them with cordiality and the greatest confidence was extended to him they became convinced during the summer of eighteen sixty four that their efforts to defeat the election of mr lincoln were hopeless lincoln had the power he said and would certainly re-elect himself and there was no hope but in force the belief was entertained and freely expressed that by a bold vigorous and concerted movement the three great northwestern states of illinois indiana and ohio could be seized and held this being done the states of kentucky and missouri could easily be lifted from their prostrate condition and placed on their feet and this in sixty days would end the war it was resolved to hold a series of peace meetings in illinois for the purpose of preparing the public mind for such a revolt the first of these meetings was to be held at peoria and to make it a success says thompson i agreed that so much money as was necessary would be furnished by me it was held and was decidedly successful but he pretends that the niagara falls conference and lincoln's letter to whom it may concern shocked the country to such an extent that the leading politicians conceived the idea that lincoln might be beaten at the ballot-box on such an issue the nerves of the leaders he says thereupon began to relax the seizure of arms at indianapolis the arrest of leading supporters at louisville the unsympathetic attitude of mr macdonald the democratic candidate for governor of indiana all tended to discourage the ringleaders and the day fixed for the revolt which was to have been the sixteenth of august passed by with no demonstration the necessity of pandering to the military feeling which resulted in the nomination of mcclellan totally demoralized says thompson the sons of liberty convinced that there was nothing to be expected from the co-operation of northern democrats thompson fell back once more upon his gang of escaped prisoners and other loose fish in canada the next scheme adopted by him was ingenious and audacious and not without possibilities of success he determined to capture the war steamer michigan plying on lake erie and with her to liberate the rebel prisoners on johnson's island in sandusky bay the prisoners were then to march upon cleveland attacking that town by land and by water and thence march through ohio to gain virginia a man named charles h cole formerly one of forrest's 
troopers was sent round the lakes as a deck passenger to inform himself thoroughly of the approaches to the harbors the depositories of coal the stations and habits of the michigan he performed his task with energy and efficiency and with great satisfaction and amusement to himself he invented an oil corporation of which he was president and board of directors opened an office in buffalo and used a good deal of thompson's money in making the acquaintance of the officers of the michigan the nineteenth of september was the day fixed for the attempt upon the michigan cole having contrived to have himself invited to dine with the officers of the vessel on that day a virginian named john yates beale was assigned the more difficult and dangerous part of the enterprise he with twenty-five confederates took passage from sandwich in canada on board the philo parsons an unarmed merchant vessel plying between detroit and sandusky they were all armed with revolvers and had no trouble in taking possession of the steamer and robbing the clerk of what money he had they soon afterwards fell in with another unarmed steamer the island queen scuttled her and then steered for sandusky bay to join coal and the boats he had prepared in an attack upon the michigan but the plan miscarried the military aware of cole's intentions had captured him and beale missing the signals which had been agreed upon did not dare to proceed in the enterprise alone he therefore returned to sandwich and his crew scattered through canada beale was not content with the failure of this enterprise and later in the season in the middle of december he was caught in the state of new york near the suspension bridge in an attempt to throw a passenger train from the west off the railroad track for the purpose of robbing the express company this was the third attempt which he had made to accomplish this purpose he was in citizen's dress engaged in an act of simple murder and robbery yet he imagined that the fact that he had a confederate commission in his pocket would secure him against punishment in case of capture he was tried by court-martial and sentenced to death jefferson davis took the same view of the talismanic character of the confederate commission upon which beale had relied and issued a manifesto assuming the responsibility of the act and declaring that it was done by his authority there was great clamor in regard to the case and many people of all parties pleaded with mr lincoln to commute the sentence of beale a petition in this sense was signed by most of the democratic members of the house of representatives and by many republicans but the judge advocate general reported that beale convicted upon indubitable proof as a spy guerrillero outlaw and would-be murderer of hundreds of innocent persons travelling in supposed security upon one of our great thoroughfares fully deserved to die a felon's death and the summary enforcement of that penalty was a duty which government owed to society loath as mr lincoln was at all times to approve a capital sentence he felt that in this case he could not permit himself to yield to the promptings of his kindly heart he sent a private message to general dix saying he would be glad if he would allow beale a respite of a few days to prepare himself for death but positively declined to interfere with the sentence and beale was hung in the latter part of february the virginia senate made his cause their own and recommended by resolutions of the third of march the adoption of such steps as might be necessary in retaliation for the offence committed by the authorities of the united states under thompson's orders the large prison camps in the north had been thoroughly examined with a view of effecting the release of the confederate prisoners confined in them but the attempts at different places were given up for one reason or another and it was resolved to concentrate all the efforts of the conspirators upon camp douglas at chicago a large number of rebels and their sympathizers were gathered together in that city and the plan for taking the prison camp with its ten thousand confederate prisoners was matured and was to have been put into execution on the night of election day taking advantage of the excitement and the crowds of people in the streets to surprise the camp release and arm the prisoners of war 
cut the telegraph wires burn the railway stations and seize the banks and stores containing arms and ammunition it was hoped that this would excite a simultaneous rising of the sons of liberty throughout the state and result in the release of the confederate prisoners in other camps but the plot as usual was betrayed by repentant rebels who were in the most secret councils of the conspirators shortly after midnight on the seventh of november colonel benjamin j sweet commanding camp douglas trapped in their various hiding-places and took prisoners all the leaders of the contemplated attack among them john h morgan's adjutant-general st leger grenfell colonel marmaduke a brother of the rebel general the commanding officer of the sons of liberty in the state and several other officers of the rebel army who were escaped prisoners in one house they found two cart-loads of revolvers loaded and capped two hundred stands of muskets loaded and a large amount of ammunition mr thompson hesitated at nothing which he thought might injure the people of the united states any villain who approached him with a project of murder and arson was sure of a kindly reception soon after i reached canada he says a mr minor major visited me and represented himself as an accredited agent from the confederate states to destroy steamboats on the mississippi river and that his operations were suspended for want of means i advanced to him two thousand dollars in federal currency and soon afterward several boats were burned at st louis involving an immense loss of property to the enemy money has been advanced to mr churchill of cincinnati to organize a corps for the purpose of incendiarism in that city i consider him a true man and although as yet he has effected but little i am in constant expectation of hearing of effective work in that quarter another miscreant of the same type named colonel martin who brought an unsigned letter from jefferson davis to thompson expressed a wish to organize a corps to burn new york city he was allowed to do so says mr thompson and a most daring attempt has been made to fire that city but their reliance on the greek fire has proved a misfortune it cannot be depended on as an agent in such work i have no faith whatever in it and no attempt shall hereafter be made under my general directions with any such materials a party of eight persons mostly escaped prisoners were sent to new york to destroy that city by fire one of them named kennedy was captured tried and hung before his execution he confessed that he had set fire to four places barnum's museum lovejoy's hotel tammany hotel and the new england house the others he said with a certain sense of wrong only started fires where each was lodging and then ran off had they all done as i did we would have had thirty-two fires and played a huge joke on the fire department this stupid tool of baser men escaped to canada but replying as beale did on his commission as a captain in the confederate army he started once more for the confederacy by way of detroit and was arrested by detectives in the railway station he had taken on a new name and a new character and in his trial among the evidence he brought forward which he thought would ensure his immunity was a pledge given to the transportation agent in canada to return with all due diligence to the confederacy even after his sentence he had no realization of the crime he had committed he wrote to the president arguing as a matter of law that death was too severe a penalty for arson and suggesting that there was no need of punishing him as an example since the execution of beale had already served that purpose if mr thompson is to be believed it would appear that his adherents in canada were not altogether under discipline and that they sometimes took the opportunity to indulge in casual burglaries and murders on their own account he said in his official report that he knew nothing of the st albans affair until after it was over this was a crime of unusual atrocity and bad fare for the moment to involve the most serious consequences a party of confederate thieves some twenty or thirty strong came over the border from canada on the nineteenth of october and entering the village of st albans in vermont they robbed the banks of some two hundred and fifty thousand dollars accompanying this crime with entirely uncalled for cruelty firing upon the unarmed citizens killing one man and wounding another they also attempted to burn several houses 
the raid was over in less than an hour and the band who had stolen horses enough in the vicinity to mount them all immediately returned to canada it seemed at first as if the canadian authorities intended to arrest the criminals and hold them for punishment and mr seward two days afterwards expressed his gratification to the british legation at washington for this prompt and apparently satisfactory proceeding as it turned out however he spoke too quickly for judge coursal discharged the criminals from custody and restored to them the money they had stolen as soon as this intelligence reached new york general dix outraged beyond endurance by the iniquity of the act without consultation with the government issued an order directing all military commanders on the frontier in case of further acts of depredation and murder to shoot down the murderers or the persons acting under commissions from the rebel authorities at richmond and further instructing them that if it should be necessary with a view to their capture to cross the border between the united states and canada to pursue them wherever they might take refuge and on no account to surrender them to the local authorities but to send them to the headquarters of the department of the east for trial and punishment by martial law the president who felt no less keenly than general dix the wrong and outrage committed by these rebel murderers and the canadian authorities who seemed to be protecting them nevertheless declined to allow any subordinate to embroil the country with a foreign nation in this way and in spite of general dix's vehement defence of what he called the right of hot pursuit the president required him to revoke the instructions quoted the british government directed lord monk the governor-general of canada to be guided by the decision of the proper legal authorities in the provinces whether persons in custody ought or ought not to be delivered up under the treaty of extradition saying that in case the decision were that they ought to be delivered the government would approve lord monk's acting on this decision and in case of the contrary decision the government suggested that they should be put upon trial on the charge of misprision and violation of the royal prerogative by levying war from her majesty's dominions against a friendly power the criminals whom judge curassol had released were again captured the canadian parliament reproved the action of curassol and suspended him from office the prisoners having been once more arrested the matter was heard before mr justice smith of montreal who again discharged them on the ground that young the ringleader of the party bore a commission in the confederate army that mr clement c clay an associate of thompson's as confederate commissioner was aware of young's purpose and gave him a check for four hundred dollars for his expenses the attack on st albans he said must therefore be regarded as a hostile expedition undertaken and carried out under the authority of the so-called confederate states by one of the officers of their army he held that the prisoners had not acquired any domicile in canada nor lost their national character by their residence there the government of canada was not satisfied with this pettifogging plea and arrested the prisoners anew but the war having now come to an end the case was languidly prosecuted and the criminals received no punishment the canadian authorities however desiring to maintain amicable relations with the united states and to do substantial justice in the case in spite of the courts refunded fifty eight thousand dollars of the money stolen by the raiders being the gold value of some eighty seven thousand which was in their possession when they came into the custody of the canadian courts and an attempt was made in the provincial legislature to pass a law which should prevent the setting on foot of such unlawful expeditions from canadian soil in the future End of chapter one Chapter Two of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight, by John Hay. Chapter Two, Habeas Corpus. The decision of Chief Justice Taney in the Merriman case led to a wide discussion of the constitutional principles involved in the suspension of the privilege of habeas corpus attorney-general bates 
the principal law officer of the government in an elaborate review of the matter gave as his opinion that in a time like the present when the very existence of the nation is assailed by a great and dangerous insurrection the president has the lawful and discretionary power to arrest and hold in custody persons known to have criminal intercourse with the insurgents or persons against whom there is probable cause for suspicion of such criminal complicity and in summing up the case he said to my mind it is not very important whether we call a particular power exercised by the president a peace power or a war power for undoubtedly he is armed with both he is the chief civil magistrate of the nation and being such and because he is such he is the constitutional commander-in-chief of the army and the navy and thus within the limits of the constitution he rules in peace and commands in war and at this moment he is in the full exercise of all the functions belonging to both these characters in the general discussion which this question excited a strict party line divided the advocates of the union and the publicists who adhered to the democratic party theophilus parsons lent the great weight of his name and learning to the side of the executive joel parker wrote an elaborate treatise on the same side and the venerable horace binney in an exhaustive pamphlet sustained to the fullest extent this power which the president had considered it his duty under the constitution to exercise in language whose simple vigor recalls the style of mr lincoln himself mr binney said it is not a season for the judicial trial of all persons who are implicated in the rebellion it cannot be while the rebellion lasts to arrest and try even those who are openly guilty and are taken with the red hand would in many places be fruitless and only aggravate the evil the methods and devices of rebellion are infinite they are open or covert according to necessity or advantage in arms or as spies emissaries correspondents commissaries proveditors of secret supplies and aids their name is sometimes legion all treasonable and many of them disguised or lying hid a part of this disguise may sometimes be detected and not often the whole an intercepted letter an overheard conversation a known proclivity an unusual activity in unusual transactions in munitions or provisions or clothing a suspicious fragment and no more without the present clue to detection may appear not enough for the scales of justice but abundantly sufficient for the precautions of the guardian upon his watch such are the universal accompaniments of rebellion and constitute a danger frequently worse than open arms to confront it at once in the ordinary course of justice is to ensure its escape and to add to the danger yet the traitor in disguise may achieve his work of treason if he be permitted to go on and if he is just passing from treason in purpose to treason in act his arrest and imprisonment for a season may save both him and the country we will add also the words in which mr binney closes his admirable treatise as probably nothing can be found which was written upon the subject sounder in law or clearer in expression the conclusion of the whole matter is this that the constitution itself is the law of the privilege and of the exception to it that the exception is expressed in the constitution and that the constitution gives effect to the act of suspension when the conditions occur that the conditions consist of two matters of fact one a naked matter of fact and the other a matter of fact conclusion from facts that is to say rebellion and the public danger or the requirement of public safety whichever power of the constituted government can most properly decide these facts is master of the exception and competent to apply it whether it be congress or the president the power can only be derived by implication as there is no express delegation of the power in the constitution and it must be derived to that department whose functions are the most appropriate in it congress cannot executively suspend all that a legislative body can do is to authorize suspension by giving that effect to an executive act and the constitution having authorized that there is no room for the exercise of legislative power the constitution intended that for the defense of the nation against rebellion and invasion 
the power should always be kept open in either of these events to be used by that department which is the most competent in the same events to say what the public safety requires in this behalf the president being the properest and the safest depositary of the power and being the only power which can exercise it under real and effective responsibilities to the people it is both constitutional and safe to argue that the constitution has placed it with him constant and elaborate efforts were made in congress to define the limits of the executive prerogative in this direction and they were not entirely confined to the democratic party even so staunch a republican as lyman trumbull offered a resolution on the twelfth of december eighteen sixty one instructing the secretary of state to inform the senate whether any persons had been arrested and imprisoned in the loyal states of the union and if so under what law such action had been taken this resolution was on the sixteenth referred to the judiciary committee a proceeding equivalent to its rejection by a vote of twenty five to seventeen six republican senators voting with the democrats in the minority but it was of course from the other side of the house that the most frequent and most vehement attacks upon this exercise of executive power were directed james a bayard james a mcdougall and others seized every opportunity of bringing the question forward with the uniform result of seeing their resolutions buried by a reference to the committee of the judiciary early in the year eighteen sixty two however the president issued an order through the war department referring to the critical circumstances of the country through the past year which in his opinion had justified the resort to extraordinary measures of repression and then went on to say that a favorable change of public opinion had occurred that the line between loyalty and disloyalty was now plainly defined that apprehensions of public danger and facilities for treasonable practices had diminished with the passions which prompted heedless persons to adopt them that the insurrection was believed to have culminated and to be declining in view of these facts and anxious to favor a return to the normal course of administration so far as regard for the public welfare would allow the president directed that all political prisoners or state prisoners then held in military custody be released on their subscribing to a parole engaging them to render no aid or comfort to the armies in hostility to the united states the secretary of war was authorized to accept from the effect of this order any persons detained as spies in the service of the insurgents or others whose release involved any danger to the public safety as the principal criticisms of congress had been directed against the action of the secretary of state in making arbitrary arrests the president in this general order announced that extraordinary arrests would hereafter be made under the direction of the military authorities alone and on the twenty seventh of february the president issued a further order appointing major general dix and the hon edwards pierpont of new york to examine the cases of state prisoners remaining in the military custody of the united states and to determine whether in view of the public safety and the existing rebellion they should be discharged or remain in military custody or be remitted to the civil tribunals for trial the tendency of all civil wars is to accumulate arbitrary power in the hands of the government the temptation to abuse of power is generally too great to be resisted by those who wield control of the constabulary and the army in times of civil tumult we believe there is no instance in history with the exception of the one we are now considering where the government sustained by a large majority of the citizens its physical force supplied by a devoted army and its hands upheld by the enormous moral support of a loyal judiciary has voluntarily relinquished the great powers freely confided to it and has from the beginning to the end of a great war continually restricted the application of its powers and diminished instead of increasing the frequency of its resort to arbitrary measures once again in the autumn of eighteen sixty two on account of the necessity of enforcing the draft which had then been ordered in several states and restraining the action of disloyal persons tending to hinder this measure the president ordered that during the existing insurrection and as a necessary measure for suppressing the same all rebels and insurgents their aiders and abettors within the united states and all persons discouraging volunteer enlistments 
resisting military drafts or guilty of any disloyal practice affording aid and comfort to the rebels against the authority of the united states should be subject to martial law and liable to trial and punishment by court-martials or military commission and that the writ of habeas corpus was suspended in respect to all persons arrested or imprisoned by the military or by the sentence of court-martials on the twenty second of november eighteen sixty two an order from the war department directed that all persons then in military custody who had been arrested for discouraging volunteer enlistments opposing the draft or for otherwise giving aid and comfort to the enemy in states where the draft had been made or the quota of volunteers and militia had been furnished should be discharged from further military restraint when congress came together in december of the same year there was a disposition among the republican majority to put an end to the discussion of the question as to whether the president was authorized to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus by expressly granting him such authority on the eighth of december thaddeus stevens introduced a bill to indemnify the president and other persons for suspending the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and acts done in pursuance thereof and after its second reading moved that its consideration be made the special order for the next thursday ensuing this motion was objected to upon which in his energetic not to say arbitrary manner he instantly moved the previous question and thus being sustained the bill was read the third time and passed it was a bill of great and far-reaching importance it not only provided for full indemnity for all arrests and imprisonments made under the authority of the president but it also provided that the president under the existence of the rebellion might suspend at discretion the privilege of the writ it passed the house by a vote of ninety to forty-five exactly two to one upon which thirty-six of the minority made a vehement and passionate protest which however was not permitted to be entered upon the journal of the house the bill went to the senate and there after some inconsiderable amendments it passed that body by a vote of thirty-three to seven on the twenty seventh of january and the house having refused to concur in the amendments the committee of conference agreed upon a report which was accepted in both chambers in the house by a majority of ninety-nine to forty-five and in the senate without a record of yeas or nays by this bill which was signed in the closing hours of the session on the third of march eighteen sixty three it was provided that during the rebellion the president of the united states whenever in his judgment the public safety might require it was authorized to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in any case throughout the united states or any part thereof whenever the privilege should be suspended no military or other officer should be compelled in answer to any writ of habeas corpus to return the body of any one detained by him by authority of the president upon such officer certifying under oath that the prisoner was detained by him under authority of the president further proceedings under the writ should be suspended by the court which had issued it so long as the suspension by the president should remain in force and the rebellion continue the second section provided for the furnishing to the courts of a list of all political prisoners and the proceedings to be taken for their discharge another section provided that the order of the president should be a defense in all proceedings in prosecution of acts contained under this law and also that such suits begun in state courts might be transferred to united states courts during the summer following the passage of the statute authorizing the suspension of the privilege of the writ the enrollment and draft of the national forces was going on the work of the officers charged with this duty was greatly impeded by the constant resort to legal expedients by drafted men and their friends and by those politicians who wished to embarrass the government by making an issue of opposition upon every executive act general fry says the action of the civil courts in the foregoing particulars threatened for a time in several districts to defeat or at least to suspend the business of raising troops and of arresting deserters and either to throw the officers of this bureau into custody or keep them so constantly before the courts as to prevent their attendance upon the duties for which they were appointed and thus to defeat the raising of an army according to the law in this state of things the president saw no course open to him except to avail himself of the powers conferred by the statute he therefore on the fifteenth of september 
issued a general proclamation reciting the provision of the constitution that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety shall require it and the fact that a rebellion was existing on the third of march eighteen sixty three and that it still existed reciting also the fact that by the statute we have referred to during the present insurrection the president of the united states whenever in his judgment the public safety may require is authorized to suspend the privilege of the writ and that in the judgment of the president the public safety then required that the privilege of the writ should be suspended throughout the united states in cases where persons are held under the command of the government as prisoners of war spies or aiders and abettors of the enemy or as soldiers or deserters or for offenses against the military service and after this preamble which proclaimed and made known to all whom it might concern that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus was suspended throughout the united states in the several cases before mentioned and that this suspension would continue throughout the duration of the rebellion or until that proclamation should be revoked he formally called on all civil and military officers of the united states to take distinct notice of this suspension and to give full effect to it and on all citizens of the united states to conduct and govern themselves accordingly the controversy as to whether congress or the president was the authority in whose discretion lay the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus was thus finally set at rest by the concurrent act of both the president's authority was never after this seriously questioned and it was used with such moderation and reserve that few just occasions for complaint arose under the law military governors appointed by the president were invested with like authority the letter of appointment gave them authority to exercise and perform within the limits of their state all the powers duties and functions pertaining to the office of military governor including the power to establish all necessary offices and tribunals and to suspend the writ of habeas corpus during the pleasure of the president or until the loyal inhabitants of the state should organize a civil government in conformity with the constitution of the united states the action of congress and the president in this regard was justified by the civil courts perhaps the most important case under the act was that of george w jones who had formerly been a united states senator and minister to bogota he had been arrested by the order of the secretary of state and imprisoned at fort lafayette after being released he brought a suit for false imprisonment claiming large damages under the provisions of the act of march third mr seward moved by his counsel to transfer the case to the united states circuit court this motion was denied by the court of first instance but a majority of the supreme court of new york affirmed the constitutionality of the act and dismissed the case the greatest care was taken by the president to restrain the officers acting under his authority from any abuse of this tremendous power he watched over this with increasing vigilance as the war went on the senate having on motion of mr powell adopted resolutions directing the secretary of war to inform the senate whether he had complied with the injunction of the act to lay lists of persons imprisoned under executive authority before the united states courts the secretary promptly replied transmitting the report of the judge advocate general showing that all possible vigilance had been used in complying with the terms of the law the rolls were necessarily incomplete the offences with which the prisoners were charged were frequently indefinitely stated and instead of specifying the particular officers by whom arrests were made the president and secretary of war assumed the responsibility in all cases although the arrests were generally made by military commanders and provost marshals without any intervention on the part of the president or secretary those arrested for military offences were tried with the greatest possible expedition and generally with a strict regard to equity and law several commissions were actively engaged in investigating the cases of the prisoners and releasing them whenever it could be done without prejudice to public safety frequent inspections of military prisons were made and not only the errors incident to the use of such enormous authority in times of civil war 
were corrected as soon as discovered but in hundreds of instances men guilty of positive offences who manifested some sense of awakened conscience were dismissed without punishment on the twentieth of june eighteen sixty four general c c augur commanding the department of washington issued stringent orders against any arrests in that department except in extreme cases where there was no doubt of guilt and notifying all his subordinates that they would be held responsible for any abuse of authority on the part of their employees these acts were the subject of the most energetic denunciation on the part of the confederate leaders and their sympathizers all over the world yet the most arbitrary acts of the federal government bore no comparison to those which marked the daily administration of affairs in the south on the first of march eighteen sixty two jefferson davis by virtue of the power invested in him by law to declare the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus in states threatened with invasion proclaimed martial law over richmond and for ten miles around following it with numerous arrests and imprisonments on the eighth of april following he issued a proclamation extending martial law over east tennessee and suspending all civil jurisdiction and the writ of habeas corpus the next month he issued a like proclamation extending it over six counties in virginia the year before this he had issued a general proclamation of banishment against all the adherents of the union in the south warning them to depart from the confederate states within forty days of the date of that proclamation under penalty of being treated as alien enemies if they should remain severe cruelties were practiced upon the loyal population of east tennessee from the outbreak of the rebellion until the last year of the war and were stimulated by the orders of j p benjamin while he was acting as secretary of war in the autumn of eighteen sixty one the confederate congress followed the example of the congress of the united states in passing a bill for the general suspension of the writ of habeas corpus in february eighteen sixty four at the request of jefferson davis the privilege of the writ was formally suspended during the present invasion of the confederate states by both houses of the richmond congress but to guard against any abuse of the power thus given to mr davis a series of cases authorizing the suspension of the writ was enumerated in the act of such variety and scope that any caprice or suspicion of power might easily be gratified under it End of chapter 2